If you just added up our incomes and threw it in a bank account, it wouldn't even be close to where our net worths are at. And that's because we're putting all of our money into things that are going to pay us, like index funds, like real estate, like business opportunities. Welcome to The Fi Show, where you get a behind-the-scenes look into financial independence. Here's your host, Cody and Justin. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Fi Show, where today, Justin and I are going to reflect on how far we've come since we started this podcast. Back in October 2018, Justin and I were in completely different situations than we are now. We're recording this in March of 2022. But before we do that, let me check in with Justin, who's sitting right next to me. We're still in Merida, Mexico. So Justin, I know one of your highlights is also one of my highlights, but you're much more versed in this world than I am. So take it away. Yeah. So the event Cody is alluding to was a giant luchador match. And so triple A wrestling is basically like the WWE, if you know what that is in America, but in Mexico, right? It's Mexico's version of the WWE, like that equivalent of wrestling. And we were kind of just joking around and I was wondering if there was a luchador match and they happened to be having like this big 30th anniversary match here in Merida, only 15 minutes away. Didn't think we were ever going to be able to actually find tickets. We finally found some random music store who would sell tickets to us. And so we made it happen. And that's a great thing about trips like this is you have all these cool experiences with people that you're traveling with that you'll always remember. You know, we got to see Nino Hamburguesa, Mr. Iguana, like all these crazy characters that now we will always have stories of. And the little inside jokes are, are always amazing. Like from now on, I can say things like bread bagging iguana. None of you will ever know what I'm talking about, but Cody and the rest of our crew will have these memories forever. And that's what traveling is all about. It's making those memories with friends, those little inside jokes. Cody, what was some other highlights you had from the last week? Yeah, I mean, we definitely had a more chill week this week. We kind of did a lot more of the touristy exploring, but we did make it to another cenote. I know Justin and I mentioned those in last week's intro. Basically, it's this underground cave of natural water that's fed by streams. You can go swim in them. Some have these open ceilings that are kind of exposed to the skylight. Other ones, you kind of have to climb down these treacherous staircases to get into them, but they're really cool. We went and checked out another one called San Ignacio. It's about 35 minutes away. There was this like nice beach club. We had people bringing us drinks, hanging up by the pool, but the food has been a really big highlight for me. It's just tasting kind of different parts of the world. You know, obviously when we're home, Lauren and I like to eat very kind of strict and we eat mostly the same meals week over week. And I know we've kind of all been talking about this. We do kind of get in the same rut of, you know, preparing the same old meals over and over, but we've just been kind of tasting everything, everything Mexico has to offer, going to all these different cafes and these dinner places. And just, it's been amazing. The food has been so, so good. So definitely a highlight for me. I love trying new cuisine when I'm in a new place and Merida has not disappointed. And this week, in lieu of a partner, we're actually wanted to tell you about some work that me and Cody have been doing while we're in Mexico. We kind of collaborated and made sure that the audience has access to the spreadsheet that I've used to track my own spending from the time I started when I had 38000 to now over a million dollars. So it's really worked well for me to help build those habits. And we want everyone listening to be able to have access to that same spreadsheet. You can get that over at thefyshow.com slash spreadsheet. That's thefyshow.com slash spreadsheet. And even though Justin mentioned spending, he's selling himself a little bit short because this thing includes like your net worth calculator. So every single month you see how much did my net worth increase by? You know, what do I have in these certain bank accounts or these certain investment accounts? It's not just a spending spreadsheet. Justin has literally everything tracked in there. And basically what he did was make a template version that, again, anyone can download for free and use at thefyshow.com slash spreadsheet. So like we mentioned when we kicked the episode off, This episode is going to be all about the growth that we've had over the last few years. It can be so easy to get kind of stuck in the weeds, especially a time like right now when the stock market has been down like double digits this year. And you can really start to question if you're ever going to be able to make real progress because you're only looking in the last week or the last quarter. So we hope that zooming out and kind of looking the last three and a half years can be really motivational to you guys listening. And if you have somebody who you think could also use a little motivation, you can grab the show notes, the link so that you can share it with them and they can listen to this message at the slash reflection. That's the slash reflection. Now let's jump into it. Man, all right. Looking back at 2018, Justin, when we first started this thing, I think it was October when we first hit record. We were in the hotel room that you were living in at the time after your apartment got kind of burnt to the ground, which is a whole other story in and of itself. We don't have to get into all the details there. But 
just looking back, thinking back to where we originally were when we first met, when we first hit that record button on the Fi Show, can you remember back to what you were thinking life was going to be like? Yeah, I mean, October 2018. Uh, and for those who don't know, the way me and Cody met, we had just met that same year, a couple months before at a Camp Fi. Then we go to FinCon together. And then we just start kicking off this podcast. And I just took a chance on it. I thought, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. And I don't know if I'm good at podcasting. I don't know if this is going to work. And now here we are over 160 episodes in and still rolling. So that's one little nugget. Um, the other thing is, like you mentioned, was living in Boston, living in a hotel, had had the house fire, obviously didn't expect that. Leslie had just moved to Boston. So she was moving down from New York. We'd been long distance dating for three years. And so that was going to be a huge change. Wasn't really sure how that was going to be. I was in the Air Force at the time with every intention of um, continuing in the Air Force for the full 20 year career so I could have that retirement. So I was looking at, you know, probably 43 when I would be able to leave the military. That's where my mind was. And so I thought, you know, I'll probably be in Boston another two years. I had been there for two years at the time and wasn't sure where I was wanting to go next. Maybe California, maybe Los Angeles Air Force Base. Again, Leslie moving there and, and having to kind of consider her career now that we were trying to stay together and not do the long distance thing anymore was a big part of it. But yeah, so that's kind of the way life looked. I mean, you know, I was just solely doing my index investing, nothing crazy, no side hustles, no side streams of income. And in my mind, like I said, I was going to be in the Air Force until I was 43 and had no idea where I was going to be living next. Just out of curiosity, Justin, when was that first inkling of maybe I'm not going to do this for the next 20 years? And like, how did you actually figure that out? Because I feel like stepping out of a, a career like that where you have this cushy pension at the end of it, and there's a lot of people that you probably know personally that had done it, and they're like, this is the way to do it. You're going to be in your early 40s. You're going to retire. You're going to be set for life. I guess, first of all, what triggered that? And second of all, what gave you the confidence to make that decision to ultimately quit? Yeah, it was really just like a perfect storm of things. And I think that's I would say probably obvious in most people's life that they can look back at these little dominoes things that lead to these big life changes. I'd say the place and the timing. It's not always the right place and the right time, but it's it's the place and the timing. So I started getting my first inkling kind of in 2019. You know, Leslie had been, we'd been living together full time now for a little over six months and things were going really well. So, you know, I think both of us before were really committed to the relationship, but we were also you know, cognizant of the fact that we had never lived close to each other. We'd always been long distance. And so you just don't know how that's going to work out. And now we had that extra layer of confidence. And we started thinking about where do we want to live next? Like, do we want the Air Force to have to decide where we live? What does that do to her career if I don't get Los Angeles Air Force Base and I end up in Dayton, Ohio or somewhere in Wyoming or, you know, name your place that doesn't have as much of a tech presence. And you got to remember that Although people have been working remotely for years, it was not as common as it is today. Like that was not a given that you could just go anywhere in the country and keep your tech job and keep your salary and all that sort of thing. And so definitely a big part of it was I did not want to hinder her career. Also, the job market was really hot at the time. 2019, especially like early, mid 2019 in the tech industry, companies were getting really aggressive with hiring. And I lucked out with the Air Force where my last job in the Air Force was super transferable to the civilian kind of life. I was working cloud technology, so I'm working with like AWS and Microsoft Azure and Kubernetes and all these buzzword topics. So I felt pretty confident that if there was ever a time to leave, this is the spot to where Leslie's career can be insulated and, and, and kind of flourish the most and my career can kind of flourish the most. And if I can't get a good job, coming off this experience with my background in this market than I never would. Like this is, this was my best opportunity to get out. I also got to give credit to folks like Doug Norman, who always just really motivated me and, and, and made me feel confident that like, Hey, you're going to make it. He's like, I stuck around and did the full 20. And honestly, it was probably a mistake. Like I, sh he, he's like, I should have done the guard thing and, and did it part time. He's like, I, it took away too much time from my family. Like, I could have gotten there maybe even faster if I wouldn't have done it that way. It's a safe thing and it's very scary to leave. And I uh, really empathize with people who are going through that decision because it's a very tough decision. But 
it was the best decision for me. So beginning in 2019, you just mentioned the tech market is just super hot and you have all these buzzword skills at the end of your resume in the skills section. What are your next moves? Do you start just actually applying to jobs while you're still in the Air Force? And how does that look for someone who might want to try a similar route? Yeah. So when you get ready to, to leave the military, it's generally not a like a two week notice situation. Um, there's all these programs that you are obligated to go through. They were created because in the past, you know, the military did a poor job of preparing people for the private kind of civilian workforce. And so now not only do they have these programs, but they're not optional, like you have to go through them. So you've got a pretty good bit of lead time. And yeah, you can go ahead and, and start talking with companies start applying, start building that resume. And that's part of the classes that you go through. They help, they help you build a resume. There's parts of the process that you can't skip unless you have like a verified offer in hand. So they're not just going to let you say, Hey, I don't want this. I'm okay. But yeah. So you start applying for places, um, start doing interviews. And I would encourage people, even if you're not sure if you're ready to get out, just start doing interviews. It's like this awesome practice. And it's a skill that you can always get better at. Even if you're not, have nothing to do with the military and you're sitting a job that you're fairly happy with, if a recruiter reaches out, just take the interview. Like it's really good experience. But so I started doing interviews, but actually the job I ended up landing on, they found me and I didn't even know about the job. Didn't know about this career field at all. It wasn't something I was focused in on. I really thought I was going to end up in more strict engineering career field, more technical than what I'm in now because just the way my resume reads and the way my like bachelor's was in and all that kind of thing. But this career field that I'd never even heard of reached out and found me. And honestly, it was offering more money than I knew was possible that I could make. So that's another thing. If you're in the military and you're getting out, especially if you have some of those skills that are transferable, don't just shortchange yourself on what you're being paid. Then don't think you've got this cap on yourself because you don't have that civilian experience and also pay attention to how you compare what someone is offering you versus what you're making at the time, because your paycheck while you're in the military is taxed very differently uh, than the way the civilian paycheck is. So if you say you're making $70,000 in the, the military, you're going to need to make a good bit more on the civilian side because you're going to be paying so many more taxes. So keep that in mind as well. So I know we're going to get into hard numbers in a bit, but could you just give us an idea of what that salary increase was? I know that you waited on a couple offers from other companies and you're hoping that you got like this one specific one, but then this other offer came in a couple of weeks later and waiting was like the best decision you ever made. But I mean, your outlook on FI and just the future in general had to have changed because now you're not looking towards this pension. You're not gunning toward the 20 years. Now you kind of have to quote unquote, do it on your own. You have to do it either through investments or real estate or through some other means. So what was going through your head at that point? Yeah, it's true. I was not going to get that retirement pension. Doing six years doesn't mean anything. Like if you don't do the 20, you don't get it. There's some rare situations where you can do less than 20 and get it, but at six years, not very often. So I wasn't going to have that. Um, but luckily, like you said, we'll get into the hard numbers later, but my income potential was like so much higher than I thought it was. So I started seeing what was possible, like how much my payments could grow, all these stock options that I could get, which I didn't even know was a thing. And with that, and looking at the math, it started making me realize I don't need to work to 43 and have this pension, I can build my own pension per se with just building up my nest egg. And with this higher rate of income, I think instead of 43, I can retire at 33. And so it was like kind of crazy. It went from being super scary to almost like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I ever considered this road that would have made me work until I was 43. And there were some scary moments there in between where, you know, I think you mentioned like, I tried to get jobs and kept getting turned down and they were paying me less than what I was going to be making after taxes from the military. So it was going to be a decrease in pay. And so it was definitely a scary few weeks, but um, luckily I was just kind of patient, kept trying. I kept pushing for my value and, and finally got some offers that were incredible. So that kind of takes us all the way through the end of 2019. And, and we'll get into some of those hard numbers and see the way some of that changed for 2020, 2021. But that gives the way my outlook has kind of changed in life and some of those big moments since we started the podcast. But Cody, how about you? Like, what was life looking like? What's a snapshot of what Cody's world looked like in October of 2018? So this is definitely jumping back. I was 22 years old. I was working in Boston for a commercial real estate lender. 
And I was pretty miserable. I was commuting two hours each way. I was living at my mom's house. I'd moved back in for just seven months after college. And I was so burnt out. I was working between side hustles. And so I was doing the podcast. I had a blog. I was doing a little bit of freelancing. I was working like 14 to 16 hours every day, trying to squeeze in the gym. I'd be like wolfing down meals in five minutes. It just wasn't sustainable. And I looked around me. I saw my coworkers. I saw... I just didn't like what I saw. I I saw my head kind of slamming against a glass ceiling because I was like, either the guy in front of me has to get promoted or he has to retire or move companies or I'm not going anywhere. My income's kind of capped here. But my my goal was, I was like, okay, eventually people are going to move up. They are going to retire. So I was going to work there for like five to seven years. I kind of mapped it all out. I did the math. I was like, you know, in five years, I can start making 200 grand or whatever it was at the time. I actually forget the numbers now, but it's sizable in commercial real estate lending. You make good money. And I was like, I, I can hit these savings rate percentages. I'll be able to, you know, using all these calculations, I'll be able to hit FI in like five to seven years. And that's not how it happened at all. I ended up quitting seven months into that job. Best decision I ever made, but it was absolutely terrifying when I first did it because I was only making like a thousand to 1200 in those side hustles a month. And I was spending like 1000 to 1200 a month. So it was like zero cushion. I had a 0% savings rate right after I quit that job. But that's when I was able to kind of take entrepreneurial chances. And I know a lot of you who have been listening to the show for a while know that I have kind of fallen in love with entrepreneurship. But being able to save a bunch of money in that corporate job for seven months, I saved up about $50,000, which is a lot of money. But I was living as frugal as possible. I was spending like nothing every month. Like I mentioned, I moved back in with my mom driving the same car since high school, not going out to eat really at all, not really spending anything on entertainment. So I was able to pocket pretty much everything that I was making in that corporate job. That $50,000 that I saved up though, I just mentioned I was spending like a thousand bucks a month. I had like 50 months of entrepreneurial freedom. So I was like, I'm just going to go and try all these really cool random things that these ideas that I have in my head ended up going on a book tour with Grant Sabatier traveling the country for three months He taught me so much about business and growth mindset and just all these things that I probably never would have had exposure to should I had just stayed in that Boston job and was surrounded by these coworkers who were kind of just doing the same thing day in and day out, living paycheck to paycheck, making $150,000 a year. So yeah, man, that was my plan. It was honestly to just, I'm just going to grind this out for five to seven years. It's good money. Even though these people are miserable, I don't have to hang out with them for too, too long. I'm going to hit this fine nest egg thing and that's going to be the end of it. And as you know, everything kind of changed. Well, you mentioned that it was super terrifying when you did it, but then you also mentioned that it's the best decision you ever made. What's that moment when you look back and you realize, hey, it's not scary anymore. It's the best decision I ever made. I honestly think the start of that book tour. So the book tour started in March of 2019. And again, it was like butterflies in my stomach because I had these side hustles that I was trying really hard on. I just didn't have enough time in the day. I was, you know, making a little bit of money for my blog. Most of my money was coming from freelancing. I was like doing some podcast editing, building websites. I was doing some freelance writing as well. Just a bunch of random stuff, but I was only making like a thousand or twelve hundred dollars a month. And I was like, I hope that I can scale this and start to make more money with this now that I have more time. But I didn't have any proof in the pudding. I didn't have any proof of concept. So that's why it was so scary because I had literally had I went from having such a huge savings rate, like eighty or eighty five percent when I was making it was almost $80,000 at that corporate banking job to 0% savings rate. I just had enough money to pay the bills. But once I went on that book tour and started to talk to Grant, he he's like super chill and just like has a very meditative vibe to him. He's like, man, everything's going to be okay. He's like abundance mindset. Like there's enough money to go around. You can always make more money. And I was like, all right, I, I made the right decision. I'm hanging out with the right people. Even though this is terrifying right now, I think I'm going to be able to figure this all out and create a financial plan that works. It sounded like those early entrepreneur ventures were very time intensive and maybe not the greatest hourly rate that you were making and maybe not the most passive. Uh, So what would you tell that younger version of yourself to kind of help them get over that hump? And like, just what has transformed entrepreneurship for you to make it the big success that it is now? Yeah, I think the key word you said there was passive. And it was something that I didn't think about. And it was something that Grant actually taught me a lot about. He was like, always think with scale in mind. So no matter what side hustle you're doing, think about how you can scale it. How can you scale yourself out of that business? So an example that he used was one of his buddies was a dog walker for Rover or WAG or whatever, one of those platforms. And you know he was making whatever he was making and WAG would take a cut. 
But then he's like, what am I doing? He's like, I could scale this up. He had a bunch of other college friends who were also looking for side hustles. So he ended up making his own dog walking company. This kid was no longer walking dogs. He was just kind of taking the margin between, you know, what he was paying his dog walkers and what they were charging the client, kind of like what a WAG or a Rover would do. And he built his own business. So from those conversations with Grant and just seeing his mindset, I started to just think with scale in mind. So started to, you know, build some online courses, started to build email funnels that had like affiliate marketing built in. And so instead of, you know, sitting there for two hours, cranking out a piece of freelance writing, delivering it, that thing makes me zero more dollars after I deliver that thing. Or if I'm driving for Uber or Lyft, once I park the car in my driveway, I'm no longer making money from that thing. I started to think of how can I build these systems? How can I build these businesses that are going to pay me in perpetuity? So that's when I started looking at things like digital products, like online courses and eBooks and workshops and eventually real estate. And, you know, obviously we're going to talk about investing and stuff. It's also passive income, not quite as quick. You're not going to get rich quick. Obviously, Justin and I are huge proponents of investing because we're going to talk about some astronomical gains once we dig into the hard numbers. But yeah, that was the big shift for me. I think a lot of entrepreneurs or people when they think about side hustling, most of the time, they're thinking about side hustles as just straight up trading your time for money. But there's so much more to entrepreneurship. And once you kind of think with scale in mind and you think of business building and passive income and how can I kind of make this a perpetual money machine, that's when everything can change. And that's when you can you know, drastically cut down those hours every week and build the life that you love. All right, Justin, let's nerd out and get into these numbers. So I know I was just looking at your spreadsheet and it's crazy to see how far you've come and how far I've come since October 2018 when we first started recording episodes for the Fi Show, but just give us the full snapshot, the income, expenses, net worth, and you know maybe we can work through to today. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor, Coda. Now what's great? Being able to work from anywhere. You just need your laptop and decent Wi-Fi connection. Now what's not so great? Being spread out across the country and having to keep the team on the same page and focused on the same tasks. That's why I'm a huge fan of Coda. With teams working all across the country, like me and Justin right now, if your best work is spread out across a bunch of documents and spreadsheets and a stack of workflow tools you have to jump in and out all day, you need Coda, the doc that brings everything together. And the other thing is everything in Coda is synced. So you make an update in a table and it automatically shows up for everyone. You're not copy and pasting from different versions of a document to keep a super important project current. Your team can operate on the same information and collaborate the way we all want to, quickly and efficiently. With Coda, you can solve for just about anything. And right now you can get started having your team all working together on the same page for free. Head over to coda.io slash fyshow. That's C-O-D-A dot I-O slash F-I-S-H-O-W to get started for free. Coda.io slash Fi Show. Yeah, so in 2018, in October, which I was an Air Force officer as a captain in Boston, and luckily in Boston, your housing allowance, which is tax-free and is also location-dependent, so it's kind of the way of them doing a cost-of-living adjustment for your specific area. Luckily, Boston is actually one of the best in the country for how much they pay you and how much rent is. So for instance, ours was like $3,000 and I was renting a place with roommates for $700. You know, if I would have been living in a place where that housing allowance was only a thousand, cool, you know, maybe I can rent somewhere for 400, but there's there's no margins there because the ceiling is so low in those, those other areas. But anyway, that allowed me to actually make more money than most captains in the Air Force would. So I was bringing in around $7,500 a month is what I was bringing in after taxes. And my net worth, which I was super proud of, was $285,000. I was 28, you know, going to turn 29 that coming March and had was sitting at $285,000. And I mean, I really thought I was killing it. And I mean, I think, you know, I have to give myself some credit. I was doing well. I was saving 75% of my post-tax income on average back then. So I got out, joined the regular job market. As was mentioned earlier, you know, I was trying to find jobs and I'm really hard applying for, for these jobs and uh, getting bummed out because there's one that's going to pay 90000 before taxes and I don't get it. And I'm just like, oh, this is, you know, what am I going to have to accept? Like, how low is this going to go? And I know that even numbers like that is like a privileged number to say like 90,000 is a lot of money. But for me, I knew after taxes, it was going to be a step back. And I think that's always tough to do. And then I stuck with it. I was patient. I kept applying for jobs. Like I said, a company reaches out to me 
and they offer me 160000 before taxes. And then on top of that, I thought it was a typo. They're going to give me $100,000 in restricted stock. If you're not familiar with restricted stock, the way that works is you don't get any of it until you've been working there for a year. Um, then you get 25% of it. So I'd get 25 grand worth of stock after year one. And then every quarter after that, they would pay me six and a quarter percent is the kind of the way it works out. So I'd get a little over $6,000 a quarter just in stock on top of that salary. And I was just blown away. Like I started, I know I sent Cody like a, a list of all the things. I'm like, man, look how this is adding up. The 401k match is $5,000. They're giving me $150 a month for a cell phone. They're giving me 25 bucks a month for my internet. They're giving me this or give me that. I'm like, this totals up to like $190,000 equivalent, you know, income. And so it just completely changed my mind on what retirement might look like. And I thought, okay, we're going to start making some real progress and things were progressing quickly. And as everyone knows, March of 2020, I saw my nest egg drop $100,000 in one month. So now, after all that growth, I'm sitting at $360,000 in 2020, a year and a half after I got out, and I really haven't grown that much. And I'm just wondering, like, how long is this going to go? I'd gotten myself so excited about this thought of being able to retire at 33. And I'm like, man, this is really set me back. This is going to add three years maybe to my retirement. If, if, you know, cause I was so pessimistic on the market at that point. I know we had people on the podcast who mentioned they had friends who kind of could see it coming on the global news circuit and got scared, moved all their money out into cash right before the market dropped. And I was so jealous. I was like, man, if I'd have done that, think about that hundred thousand dollars. But, you know, as I think everyone in this space tries to recommend, you stick with it. It's all about the long term. And the very next month, my nest egg popped back up 50000 So after one month, half of that that I quote unquote lost is already back. And that's really when things started to climb. I think the market was up 30% over the next year that it went up. And with that good income mixed with that, I really started to see the rapid growth. So I mentioned, you know, in, in March of 2020, I'm sitting at 360000 all pessimistic. And then less than a year later, January of 2021, I'm sitting at 715000 So like I've doubled my net worth in less than a year because I just stuck with it. I just kept doing the same thing. I kept that really aggressive savings rate. Part of that as well was we made a, a kind of a random decision to move to Austin. We were on a road trip. We were passing through. We were surprising Leslie's mom. And she mentioned, hey, we got this little condo downtown that the renter is moving out of. And our wheels started spinning. It's a 375 square foot apartment, but we were kind of done with Boston. All my friends in the military were starting to leave. And so we didn't have much of a network. And the place needed fixed up. It was renting well below market rent. And so we made a deal with them that we could rent it at cost for a year if we would put some sweat equity into it, fix it up. And so we were going to rent it for $275 a month. So not only was my income the highest they ever been, but my expenses were the lowest that they had ever been. And so I was regularly saving like 95% of my income, which is kind of crazy. And then fast forward to, uh, you know, we started the podcast in October and in October, 2021, I hit a huge milestone for me personally. And I crossed the million dollar mark and because the income flow is still so good with the job, uh, even with the market down 12% this year, I've been able to keep my head above water kind of and, and stay over that, that million dollar mark, which is something I'm super proud of. And when I think about where I came from and Cody, you've seen <laughs> North Mississippi, uh, there's not a lot of people from where I grew up that can say that they became a millionaire when they were 31. Like that was huge to me. And it's something that like, I feel super lucky because all these things happen, but I'm also super proud of because there's many times in my life where I could have went a different direction and where everyone expected me to go a different direction and wouldn't have ended up here. But I hope if nothing else, I can just show people the power of compounding interest and of sticking with it and not getting terrified when you see your net worth dropping. You don't lose anything until you sell it. So that's kind of the way my hard numbers look over the last couple of years. And I would the last thing I would say is, you know, my views on spending not necessarily changed. This was always the plan. I knew once I got my net worth to a certain point to where it was this machine that could kind of feed itself 
that I would either quit or I would keep working if I was enjoying it and kind of get a little loose with the spending. And so, you know, we purchased a house in Austin in a crazy hot market. I bought a new truck. Those could both sound like maybe really irresponsible things because they're not like cash flowing properties and it's not a a 2000 Honda or a Camry. But, you know, we feel confident that the house is going to appreciate. We love the area. It's a long term play for us. We're going to Airbnb it when we travel. Like we're not going to let it be an anchor. The truck, I got a great deal on it. I could already sell it today and actually make money on it if I want to, even though I've driven it off the lot. And that's not normal, but it's this like specific point in time. And I did the analysis. And again, like if I'm like, hey, this is putting too much stress on me, we could sell the house tomorrow. We could sell the truck tomorrow. We could lower our expenses again. These things aren't forever. So just kind of taking a shot at it and seeing, are these things really important to me? Do I need a nice house? Do I need a nice vehicle? Does it make me happier? Because I'd much rather experiment with that while I have this steady flow of cash coming in than I would when I'm living off my nest egg. So just to give the listeners an idea, Justin, kind of looking at 360K in March of 2020, now we're recording this March of 2022, you're over the million mark. What is kind of your net worth breakdown? Like what percentage is in brokerage account versus, you know, retirement accounts versus I know now you have some equity in the house, but just to kind of give people an idea of like how your net worth grew that fast. Yeah, Cody, good question. Um, It's pretty even split between the retirement account and brokerage. Uh, Both are sitting right around 44, 45% of my overall nest egg, 45% in retirement accounts. So heavy 401ks. Also, obviously, have the IRAs and then 45% in brokerage. Now, some people might be wondering, like, how in the world would I have like over $400,000 in retirement accounts when I didn't start work until basically right when I started turning 24 until age like 31? Like, how do you get that much money into a retirement account? And that's had a huge boost over the last, um, you know, two years when I've discovered the mega backdoor 401k, which I know we talk a lot about. And that's allowed me to put almost $60,000 into a 401k over the, you know, each of the last three years. So the 401k that I have at this company that I've only been working at for two and a half years already has $188,000 in it. I've been working there for less than three years. So I didn't even get to really do that much that last quarter that I first started. So really only two full years of getting to invest there with a, with a little bit of another year. That's a big part of it. The other things that I have is I have $60,000 worth of investments in syndication deals, like real estate syndications. Those are paying out 8% interest year over year as they are being held. And then there will be a large payout at the very end, hopefully. (laughs) I did dabble a little bit in Ethereum. So I started investing in 2017. I ended up taking out all of like my basis, so all of my costs. So everything that's in there is quote unquote profits, even though you don't really profit till you sell it. So I've got about $40,000 worth of Ethereum that's that's all profits. Like you said, a little bit of uh, home equity, although you know we split that between myself and, and Leslie. So I only claim half of the, the home equity. And then obviously I have cash. And a lot of times I'm probably a little more cash heavy than other people might recommend in the FI space, but I also have no bonds. So it's all index funds of total stock market or S&P 500. I basically have no bonds. And so that cash is kind of my bond equivalent in a way. And I also want to set myself up to where I have about three years worth of living expenses in cash when I get ready to retire, because historically a bear market lasts for three years. And so for me, instead of leaning on bonds in those years, I just want to lean on cash Everybody has their different things that make you feel comfortable. That's kind of my hedge is that I'll turn to my cash pile during those bear markets versus bonds or versus selling off my stocks. And so it's a combination of that. And I'm also always keeping my eye on another syndication deal or some kind of other investment that I can make or hard money lending. Like I feel safer having some cash, but I'm also comfortable with deploying it and getting down to a low cash value if there's a good investment that pops up. You know, I know I've I've talked with some of the people that I've met in this space about doing hard money lending. I know you recently used some hard money lending. Um, it can actually be fairly lucrative, but you got to have the cash like sitting there ready. You can't be waiting on selling things and moving things around. Like people normally when they want it, they want it right then. So that's kind of the breakdown. All those retirement brokerage accounts are index funds. 
except for a very small portion where I will buy some individual companies when a big event happens. So for instance, in like February of 2016, there was this little flash crash and I didn't already have any money, but I had like nine grand sitting around that I felt like I could be comfortable with deploying. And so I bought like some Apple and some Amazon. And at the time I'm thinking, God, this stuff is like way overvalued. Amazon was $500 a share. Apple was $90 a share. And that's before Apple split four ways. And looking back on it, obviously, hindsight 2020, those worked out well, but they were small bets, right? There was like, there's like $3,000 worth of this and $3,000 worth of that. And then when the big crash happened because of all the COVID stuff, I looked for a couple areas that were kind of asymmetrically hit. Like they got hit harder than the rest of the market. And cruise lines was what I saw. I saw cruise lines were hit 90%. And so I thought, you know, it's worth a little bet. And so far that's worked out well. But again, it wasn't a ton of money. I think I invested maybe like 10 grand total into those, but those have paid pretty well. So every once in a while I'll dabble in an individual stock just to kind of scratch that itch. But I try to wait until it's a moment where it's kind of hard to lose. Like something's already been really hit hard before I dabble in it. Real quick, Justin, before we get into my deep dive analysis, how has your spending changed? Is it like exactly the same as it was in 2018 on a year over year basis? Has it inflated a little bit? I know you mentioned that once you hit a certain milestone, you're going to loosen the reins on, on spending some, but just wanted to get those hard numbers on to show listeners exactly how you've done it. I'll go kind of far back, but only because I've got the numbers and it'll be really quick. So I started tracking all this in like 2015. And when I first started tracking it, my monthly expenses were $1,700 a month. 2016, it was 1800 and something a month. 2017, $2,300 a month. But then 2018, I brought it back down to $1,900 a month. I kind of had first moved to Boston and things jumped up. That was 2017. And then I started kind of figuring it out and getting it reined back in. 2019, $1,800. You can kind of see a trend. There's not a lot of inflation here. It's very flat on the spending. 2020, $1,300 a month. And that was where I mentioned, you know, we had this awesome opportunity for a win-win where we got to live in a tiny 375 square foot condo for dirt cheap in exchange for renovating it and finding tenants to rent it for 50% more than they were renting it previously. So everybody won there. And now this, this over this last year, it's a little bit of a blend of that really cheap. And now with the house, it's setting at around $2,700 is what the, over the last year. But now going forward, it's going to be closer to like the low 4,000s, like 4,300, which is more than double my average spending the rest, you know, previously. But part of that is I've got a $700 a month car payment that I could pay off tomorrow if I wanted to. Like I could get rid of that expense. So I'm not going to sit there and try to come up with enough nest egg to, to have 4% rule pay for this truck because the truck's not going to need to be paid for forever. It's also a 0% interest loan. So that's the only reason I'm not paying it off quicker. And then we have the house, which my portion of the mortgage is a little over $1,400 a month. So that has definitely greatly inflated my spending but that's the decision that I made. It's like, I want to test this out. I want to see, do these things make a difference in my life? Do I really want those? And if they don't make a difference, you know, I could have quit or I can cut them out. Instead, I'm experimenting with that. And I really like what I'm doing now. So I'm in no rush to quit. I've got the cash flow coming in. And the other crazy thing is my savings rates are still pretty solid. Like, yes, I'm spending a lot more. But for instance, last month, because I had a lot of variable income, worked out to 90% savings rate. The month before, 81% savings rate. The month before, like 72% savings rate. Like, so it's still 70% or above on the savings rate. And I think it's okay to let yourself spend a little more if you're making more. But that's probably enough about my expenses. I know that I just am over the top on how much data I keep on what I spend and what I buy and how investments perform. But it's kind of a safety blanket for me. I can look back on the data and feel really strongly that I've got enough evidence to like what life can look like that I can feel confident going forward what that might look like. And it's honestly just fun for me to track. But Cody, let's dig into kind of what your financial world looked like back in 2018 and some of those numbers and how things have progressed since then. Alrighty. So like I mentioned, 2018, I was working in commercial real estate lending. I had 
with all the bonus compensation and everything, it was about eighty to eighty-five thousand dollars I was making, which is really generous. I was twenty-two years old, coming straight out of college. But then I quit that, so I was back down to a thousand or twelve hundred dollars a month in monthly income. But I went on that book tour. Then I just started to kind of do the scale thing that Grant was talking about. Built some online courses. I was building all these different digital products, and you know, I later got into real estate. So for 2018, I worked for I don't know. I think it was from June because I graduated. Went to Australia for six months. Then I started in June. So I probably ended up making like forty forty five thousand dollars that year because I got my signing bonus at the beginning. Then I made a little bit more and then I quit at the end of January. So that's where that 50,000 number that I'd saved up. So my net worth when we first started recording, Justin, was probably like $75,000 because I'd been maxing out my Roth IRA since I was 18. So that's four years of that. It had appreciated a bit, and then I had the fifty thousand dollars. So it was probably somewhere between seventy-five and eighty k when I first started. I don't track as religiously as you. I do have a general idea. Then I quit. Then I started all this entrepreneurship and side hustling in twenty nineteen. Since I was on the road for part of the year, I did launch some of those side hustle courses, and I was just doing a bunch of random stuff. I had actually, you know, founded the Financial Freedom Summit that didn't end up happening. Thanks a lot, COVID. And, you know, that's kind of where the the idea came from in 2019. But I think I ended that year making like, I think it was like 80 or 90K by the end of the year. So it was about the same as what 2018 would have been if I had a full year in that corporate banking job. And I was like you, super frugal. I was basically pouring everything I could possibly pour into, you know, retirement accounts and then brokerage accounts, whatever the overflow was. And the market was really generous, if I can remember correctly, in 2018 and 2019. I was getting like 30% return. So really cool to see. I was making awesome progress. 2020, just kept at it with the entrepreneurship stuff. Ended up shutting down a couple of those online courses, figuring out what was working, what wasn't, what types of products I wanted to create, how email marketing works and funnels and ads and all that stuff. And again, I was being really frugal in 2020. I was saving as much as I possibly could. At the end of 2020... I think, I don't have my tax return right in front of me, but I think it was just about 195K that I ended up making, which I had doubled my, my salary or my, my earnings again, I guess, which was just incredible. Like I was, I was really trying to do the scaling thing that Grant had taught me about. And I know we had Tori Dunlap on recently who did this to the nth degree better than I did, but she was talking about how, you know, in a year or two, I think she went from like making a couple hundred dollars a month with her side hustle, her brand to, multiple millions, which I didn't quite do that. I think I'm still doing pretty good though. So also in 2020, while I'm doing all this entrepreneurial stuff, I moved to Boston for, I think it was nine months. It was almost a year. Then I ended up moving in with my now fiance, Lauren, into this little cottage we have on a lake. It's the lake house. It's a a property that my dad picked up way back in the day when it was super cheap. Can't even get it for close to it as cheap as he got it then. But then after that, we're like, we can't live in this house during the fall. It's way too cold. It's not insulated. It's literally just a summer cottage that's good for maybe three months of the year. So we started just like looking for houses. Justin and I had already interviewed so many people who had you know, done really smart things with real estate, like James and Emily, who we're staying with right now, who had retired at 27 and 28. I'm like, hey, maybe I can try this real estate thing. So Lauren and I started looking left and right, scouring all the neighborhoods around us, Unfortunately, couldn't really find anything that made sense cash flow wise. We wanted to buy a duplex or a triplex or a quadruplex, but couldn't find anything. Ended up having to buy over the border down in Connecticut. It was about a 50 minute drive. We lived there for a couple months and we actually ended up buying another property a month later after closing on that one. And then two months later after that property, we ended up buying one in a town over from our hometown. So we were kind of, you know, within three months after moving down to Connecticut, we didn't like it that much. We were back kind of near our hometown friends, but I had outlaid a ton of cash in buying property. Luckily, the market has been very generous. So just kind of, you know, trying to give you a full snapshot, I had put down probably $190,000 in town payments in 2020 on properties. And this is a whole nother episode we can get into. I know Justin and I were going to record an episode on buying property, but I didn't have the proof of income for multiple years. Like I had these side hustles that were, you know, all of a sudden doing really well, but it's not like they had any longevity. So the bank's like, we're not going to finance you. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac can't give you a loan. So I'm like, great. I ended up having to get a commercial lender, hence why I couldn't use like the FHA loan and get 3.5% down. So all that is to say I had some money in, you know, the stock market and retirement funds, uh, in the brokerage accounts, most of that just like you, Justin, was in index funds, don't hold really any bonds, had a little bit of cash, but also had a lot of this property equity. 2021, 
another kind of just crazy explosive year where I learned so much. And I don't think I've shared this anywhere, but might as well share it with you listeners. My income doubled again and I made almost $400,000 in 2021, which is honestly crazy to think back in 2018 when I was making between 1000 and 1200 a month to the income numbers that I'm pushing today. It's it's honestly mind-boggling. Like when I look at these spreadsheets when I look, log into personal capital, I just I'm honestly blessed to to be where I'm at today. So, ended up buying another property in 2021. I was pouring a ton of money into the stock market. I had maxed out like my solo 401k. Definitely go back and listen to that episode where Justin kind of talks about the mega backdoor 401k from the corporate perspective, as well as myself diving into the solo 401k from an entrepreneurial perspective. That's definitely an episode. If, if you're in either of those situations, you can just put way more in retirement accounts than you might have thought was possible. The rest of that mostly went into brokerage accounts for me, bought that property in the middle of 2021. And now today, we actually ended up selling that property we bought in the middle of 2021. It did appreciate a bit. So we made a little bit on the sale, but not much. Honestly, it was just, I think Lauren and I were in over our heads. We got really excited about buying real estate. And we're like, look, we got you know 11 doors in a year. And we were, you know, everything was going great. And I think we just kind of got trigger happy and probably shouldn't have purchased that property. It wasn't in the best neighborhood, didn't have the best tenants, but you live and you learn. Okay, so that was very long-winded. Let me bring this full circle to give you the net worth snapshot. So when I, you know, first started recording the five show with Justin, probably between seventy-five and eighty k, and now today it's I checked yesterday, it's at like one point three million, which again, which is absolutely insane. To give you the breakdown, like Justin did, I think probably fifty-five percent of that is in the stock market in some form or fashion, whether that's in a retirement account like my solo four hundred one k or in an IRA, although. I definitely have more money in my brokerage account. And then also all of our properties have appreciated quite a bit since we bought them in you know middle of the pandemic. I think since we bought them in just total property equity across the board, our net worth has increased. And this is myself and Lauren by like 150K. That's just a testament to how crazy this market is right now. I don't expect these house prices to be this high forever, but I'm just giving you the, the snapshot as we're recording here. So about 40% of my net worth is probably just in property equity. And then the other 5%, like Justin, I also dabbled a little bit in crypto. I have some Bitcoin, some Ethereum, and some Solana. This is not financial advice. But you know, Justin and I like to kind of mess around, definitely looking into some syndications and some other investment opportunities this year. But it has been an absolutely wild ride. Now, what I'll say is, you know, obviously, these numbers seem super flashy. And I'm very blessed and excited to be where I'm at today. Entrepreneurship is not for everyone. I know Justin and I have kind of had a quote unquote debate on the on this podcast before about like what's the better route and there isn't one. If you have an entrepreneurial bug, if you have an itch, you can scale your income a ton. If you like working in corporate America and you feel better in having that job security and having all the benefits that come with a job, that can also be a fantastic option. There's no right or wrong way with this, but I don't think that if I stayed in that original corporate banking job that I could be where I'm at today income wise. So yeah, Cody, like you said, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get there. And I mean, you know, when I started my journey, I was making like $40,000 a year. I had like $30,000 in my name, never expected any of this. You can get in these spots in life where you're not sure if it's going to work. It doesn't seem like it's scaling really fast, but if you stick with it and you listen to like a lot of the guests that we bring on the show and a lot of the things that I think we've incorporated in our own lives, you can multiply your earnings corporate or entrepreneurship, there are going to be scary times. There's going to be times when things don't work out. There's going to be times where the market drops. You got to zoom out a little bit and really just stick with it and double down on your strengths. You know, I'm definitely always trying to push myself and to think about other ways that I can do things, but I know myself. I know what I'm good at. I lean into that. I don't take any kind of overly insane risks. You're going to need to take some to get where you want to go. But don't over leverage yourself, stick with it, think about the long term, and don't devalue yourself. There's going to be offers that you're giving for what people think you're worth. Really test that, like check the market, see what other people are making, push for more, ask for more than you think someone is willing to pay you, and you'd be shocked at how many times that they come back with a yes. I don't know if you have anything else, Cody, you want to say to wrap up the episode. I think I just want to echo the there isn't just one path because I know when I got introduced to Fi, I really thought it was like the nest egg way or die. But, you know, as the Fi show is a testament to, there's so many different ways to do it. We have people retiring from just real estate. We have people retiring from building their own business, even though they might not have some huge net worth amount. 
And if there's something you don't want to do, then don't do it. If there's something you're not good at, like Justin was just saying, don't do that thing. Lean into your strengths. I, I really think that there is a path for everyone. You just have to, you know, get the tools to carve it for yourself. And also for those who are just getting started out, the power of compound interest is seriously the eighth wonder of the world. I think it was Albert Einstein who said that. But just looking at Justin and myself's numbers, I mean, if you're doing some quick back of the envelope math, if you just added up our incomes and threw it in a bank account, it wouldn't even be close to where our net worths are at. And that's because we're putting all of our money into things that are going to pay us like index funds, like real estate, like business opportunities. And that's something that just has happened so much faster than I could have possibly imagined. It is seriously hockey stick growth. I think Justin can also attest to this. The money that I made last year in the stock market is multiples of what I made in my full-time corporate job. Like that's just mind-blowing to me and it's money that I didn't have to trade my time for. So if you are one of those people who is super intimidated by investing, you haven't started yet, maybe you don't have a lot of money saved up, you can seriously start with $5. I think most brokerages, even some of them might be a dollar minimum. You can start with almost nothing. And also just the fact that there are all these online brokerages and all this free investing information online. It's not like it was in the 80s where you have to call up your stockbroker and you have to have the insider tips and you have to like be really knowledgeable to start investing. You can do it in a couple of clicks after reading a couple of articles or listening to a podcast like ours and it will seriously change your financial future. But I think that is a wrap. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. I know Justin and I have a ton of fun when we kind of do these deep dive reflections on ourselves and we've got a ton of positive feedback. So hopefully this episode can serve as inspiration to you or maybe a friend. I know Justin mentioned at the beginning, this episode, including a quick summary, can be found at thefiveshow.com slash reflection. And we'll see you next week. And as always, if you want to check out our Facebook group page, you can do so at thefiveshow.com slash community. And we always appreciate those five-star reviews. They help us get great guests like we had today. And if you're interested in supporting The Fi Show, you can do so by checking out some of our partners over at the resources page, which can be found at thefyshow.com slash resources. And thanks for listening.